Hello, and welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in business and in life and simplify them. Friends, I want to talk about a nice, juicy, wonderful night's sleep tonight. Let's simplify that, like getting a better night's sleep. Doesn't that sound nice? Everybody, raise your hand. Yes, me too. So I had to find the right expert for this specific topic because you guys have been asking for this for a while now to simplify. And I think I have found her. Her name is Shay Leonard, and she is a certified and licensed physician assistant and functional health health coach. So she specializes in mental health, gut, and hormonal health. Now, her work has led her to learn about how to optimize one's genetics, improve mental health resiliency through meditation, amino acid therapy, nutrition, sleep hygiene, and more. So I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, Shay Leonard. Hey, Shay. Hi, Mary. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm sure there is quite a few people that are listening right now that have probably had a couple of bouts of insomnia. I mean, like especially people in the States with all things going on in the news and government and all the insanity out there. But I really want to back this up because, yes, there will always be stress and things that are going crazy, you know, whirlwinds in our lives. But I think that there is um, some place I'd like to begin is actually to talk about sleep hygiene. Like, how would you define that? And why is it important for us to focus on it right now? I love this as our starting point, because sleep hygiene is where it all starts. And it's really simple. And it's perfect for very fitting for the podcast itself. But Mm. sleep hygiene itself is just about giving the body the right vibes, the right signals to induce a good sound sleep. And that's really all it means is how can I tell my body, give it all the right signals that it's safe and time to fall asleep and repair and rest. Mm. And that is all it's about. Yes. So why now? Why why do you think people need to really think about uh, how well they're sleeping at night? Because I can imagine, I won't name any names, a few friends that are listening and even a few co-workers of mine who are like, Shay, I only need four hours a night. Like, it's no big deal. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Are they actually fine? No. So <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say the two biggest issues that it's facing modern lifestyle right now is stress and sleep. And they go hand in hand. And we have to have sleep. Literally, it is a healing process. It's where we we restock our hormones. We process and get rid of toxins. We repair damaged tissue. We regenerate vital white blood cells for immune yeah. system. We eliminate the effects of stress. We process even mental emotions during sleep, it is vital. It's not a, a, like there's no negotiating about it. It yeah. is vital every day. Well, and I mean, even as you just list that laundry list of things that our body does, like, I don't yes. know if every now and again, I'm just like, that is incredible. Like, I don't actually yeah. have to tell my body to do those things. It just <laughs> magically does it all in its own and, and so awe inspiring. Mm-hmm. But I think it, again, it just reminds me what I hear and what you just said there is that we're not robots. Like you just can't power us off and power on and expect everything to be at 100%. There's a lot of things happening while we're asleep that we're not even aware of, right? Absolutely. So true. Mm. So where's the first step? What would you recommend for people interested in getting a better night's sleep tonight? The biggest thing, and we'll get into some very specifics, but I would just really try to figure out why do we think we're not sleeping well? Not sleeping well is a symptom. It's There's mm. some bigger reason. There's something upstream that is our body wants to sleep. It needs to. It wants to do that. So if we're having issues with sleeping, there is a reason. So finally, using your intuition, stopping and asking yourself, what am I doing day to day, week to week? that's conducive for sleep or not conducive for sleep? What choices do I make every day that are either helping or harming my whole sleep pattern? And really, that's where I always start because a lot of times our intuition is the most important. And a lot of my clients, they're like, oh, it's probably because I have caffeine at eight o'clock at night in my chocolate bar. Mm. Didn't think about that before, but maybe that's what it is. Or maybe it's because I go and I do a really hard hit workout at 8 p.m. and I can't turn off my brain or Maybe it's because I do my to-do list and laundry at 9.30 p.m., right? They kind of know. So we start asking those questions, and and most of my clients' intuition really tells them. So that's always the first start of let's just ask ourselves, 
what probably is contributing to a poor night's rest. Yeah. And what I hear in that is, is looking at when you say the signals, um, it's, it's like getting deeper into what the root cause is behind the insomnia. Because I think, gosh, in this day and age, there are a bazillion pills and a bazillion uh, band-aids you can put on symptoms and problems that you're having. Just the same as somebody who has a tummy ache who takes indigestion pills. Um, I I hate to think that there are people out there right now listening that are taking sleeping pills because they're like, this is what I need in order to sleep. And is that true? No. So there's always a root cause. Things don't, like I said, this goes against nature. Our nature is to sleep. So there's something disrupting it. Of course, uh, prescription medications like um, ADHD medications during the day can cause issues with sleep at night. Then you have to take a pill for that, right? Um, And then all sorts of lifestyle factors, too much stress and imbalance in cortisol and melatonin due to stress, this Mm -hmm. imbalance in in these different... um, access, um, HPATG access. Um, and then of course, like we mentioned, just general sleep hygiene, drinking caffeine at night or eating too late or, you know, watching too much crime drama (laughs) in the middle, you know, right (laughs) Right. before bed, you know, there's so many different things, but nutrient deficiencies, lack of serotonin, um, lack of magnesium, there's so many root causes, Mm. but, um, but ultimately sleep hygiene is the perfect way to start um, identifying those issues. Mm, Very good point. And if if I can just make a tiny little confession to you right now, I I know no one's listening. It's just between you and me. But (laughs) when I was in my early 20s and teens, I loved drinking big giant cups of coffee. I, it was just like, it was for me. And, and at that stage of my life, I was like, I can do this. No problem. I'd drink coffee till like one o'clock in the morning, be totally fine. Could totally sleep. Right. But now in my early forties, uh, if I drink coffee after say two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm toast. Like I truly Mm -hmm. am toast. I'm, I'm kind of laying there in bed, you know, tossing and turning. I can't get a good solid night's rest. Is there some truth to that of like our body as it gets older and matures, uh, gets, you know, changes how it responds to these triggers, right? Oh, absolutely. So Mm -hmm. some people, number one, genetically process and metabolize caffeine differently. Some people are ultra rapid metabolizers. And so, you know, they can have a little bit of caffeine in the evening and it doesn't seem to bother them. They're the minority. But Um, yeah, so there's lots of different factors that contribute to that, but age at a baseline because our hormones are changing and melatonin is a hormone. Cortisol, um, is a hormone. These things change and fluctuate over time, depending on our environment, what we're going through, um, aging itself, all these different factors. So absolutely. And that's where we see seasons of gosh, you know, last year I didn't have a sleeping issue at all. And now all of a sudden I do. And then two weeks later, it's good. And a week later, it's not. That's going to have happen. We're going to have this ebb and flow based on what we're exposing ourselves to, what our environment is um, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Mm, It makes a lot of sense. And also imagine, as you say, like the seasons of temperature, you know, do you sleep better in the wintertime than say when it's blazing hot outside in the summer? So Mm -hmm. I know you teach your clients the seven fundamentals for a great night's sleep and great sleep hygiene. Let's go over all seven just at a high level and then take a deep dive into a few of them. So can you lead us through that? Yeah, that sounds great. So there's seven. They're not in any particular order. But the first one is let's just choose more calming evening activities. Um, How can we just relax, read a book, take an Epsom salt bath, maybe go for a light stroll outdoors early evening, playing with a pet, you know, something that's very relaxing activity instead of, you know, let's go be very rambunctious and running around. And I know with kiddos, they tend to do that too. And so as parents, you know, you're running around chasing the kiddo and it's nine o'clock at night and everyone has a hard time, you know, calming down. So choosing more calming, quiet evening activities is number one. And, you know, I should back up to say this, Shay, like all the things you're going to say, all of us are going to be like, well, this is Captain Obvious, but how many times do we actually do this? Like, so as she's Uh, talking through this, like take notes, do one or two of these things tonight and actually test it out. Um, Because I think it's just like, oh, well, yeah, of course. I'm not going to like, you know, do heavy lifting uh, mentally or physically late at night right before sleep. But then we do, right? Yep. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, it's so common and I think that's why I love it. It's so simple. Sleep hygiene is simple. Uh, we just aren't very good at doing it consistently. Yeah. Okay, so what's the next one? Number two is turning off all full spectrum blue light for at least one to two hours before bedtime. No email, TV, smartphone, or apps. This is the hardest, especially right now in this day and age. We go to bed on our phone and we wake up on our phone. And it Mm. is a problem. It's really impacting our circadian rhythm. If you think about going back to cavemen, right? They followed the natural sunrise, sunset. We have to have darkness to produce adequate melatonin and really get rid of that cortisol. So when we're watching TV late at night, we're doing a podcast with a light late at night, it's going to be very hard to fall asleep after because first and foremost, we're signaling that it's daytime. We're telling our body, get revved up. It's time to wake up. And it's in the middle of the night. So darkness is huge. We have to have to tell our body that it's dark and it's time for rest and sleep. Mm, So I want to go a little bit deeper on this because I have heard a lot of people talk about um, light pollution uh, and full spectrum light. I really want to break that down for anybody who doesn't know what that term means. Like what's a full spectrum light? Is that any household light in in your home? Most commonly, um, it it just has all the waves, all the color waves in in Mm. full spectrum light. Um, But blue light specifically from um, TVs and phones and things like that. Um, they really emit a very powerful thing. I mean, light therapy itself has been studied and has been very useful in depression and seasonal depression. We know it stimulates us and it can be helpful. So just as much as it can be helpful during the day or in the morning for someone who's going through very seasonal depression, Mm. we do not need it at nighttime. We know peer reviewed articles that this does play a role in, um, our sleep. Do you know, I, okay, another um, a confession here. I give my friends, Tim and Jacko, over at the School of Calisthenics, a hard time. Anytime I jump on a call with them and they've got these like red lens Bono type <laughs> glasses on because they know they've, they've done this research themselves on uh, how bad full spectrum light really is at night. You do kind of look like a dork when you wear those, but they have said to me, you know, pointedly that they have get, got much, much better sleep at night when they do that. If they are having to jump on a Zoom call in the evening or, you know, watch TV, they pop on these red lens glasses. Are there other things that you guys use or have your clients have used as well? Yeah, of course. It's better than nothing. If you're going to have to use something, um, there's screens now, you know, screen protectors that you don't have to wear the glasses. Um, You can also do like orange Mm -hmm. like Himalayan salt lamps at night in bed. If you're going to read a book, don't turn your bright fluorescent, you know, side table lamp on. Let's use more of like an orange glow, a more relaxing um, type light that is not fluorescent or blue um, to really kind of help um, diminish some of those side effects. Yeah. And again, it's, it, it, you might just try one or two of the things that Shay talks about today and just see for a week if it is changing your quality of sleep. And, you know, uh, you know, if anybody pokes fun at you like me with my friends, <laughs> you just <laughs> tell them, Hey, look, I'm sleeping really well. You're not, that's just how it is. I heard it on a podcast and move on from there. Okay. Exactly. So tell, tell us another one. Uh, Number three, this is just to avoid amping up your brain, not just with lights, but activities such as, like I mentioned, watching a crime drama. Mm -hmm. A lot of my clients plan their next day's activities right before bed. That can also become stressful or having difficult conversations with a spouse right before bed. That can also be way too stimulating. Your brain is just like getting ready to fight or flight. It's on, it's ready to, you know, start the day and it's not ready for um, sleep. Also, drinking or eating things with caffeine or natural stimulants in them, including green teas, coffee, sodas, chocolate, things like that before bed. Mm. You know, that that makes me think about a past episode that we recorded here um, last season with Trevor Blake. He simplified like how to structure your five hour work day. And one of the things that he had mentioned is at the end of the day, you know, the last 15 minutes or so, you do create your to do list uh, for the next day in that moment. But that for him is at like, you know, 445 in the afternoon. 
not at 10 o'clock at night, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like compartmentalizing um, bits and pieces of your work and really holding true to those boundaries, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a perfect example of where to just rearrange your schedule so that that's not an issue for you in the evening. Yeah. And, you know, when it comes to boundaries now more than ever, I I know, um, because I'm guilty of it myself, is that for a lot of you guys, you're working from home. Maybe you weren't working from home previously and you Mm -hmm. could actually close the door at an office, get in your car and come home. But now things are sort of bleed together. Mm -hmm. Um, You really do have to be steadfast with those boundaries and say, okay, this is end of the work day. I'm shutting the laptop. I'm putting that work phone away. Um, and, and like really stay strict to it. Um, so that the time that you have in the evening is your time, quality time with your family or, or children, um, or even just with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a game changer. I mean, those boundaries are so vital, especially working from home right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, it makes a big difference in your quality of life. And I see the the truth in um, the friends who have two phones, one that's a work cell and one mm-hmm. that is a, you know, non-work cell so that you truly can put that phone away. Because I think there's that temptation of like, oh, I'll just answer that one quick email late at night right before sleep uh, or I'll just yeah. answer that WhatsApp message. Mm-hmm. Um, But I think the truth there is if I get a message from a client at 10 o'clock at night and I respond, then you're sending a message to that client that either A, well, she has no boundaries at all, so I'm going to text her anytime because she's told me it's okay. And B, it's possibly telling your client like, well, gosh, she is so overworked and over, you know, <laughs> overwhelmed. Why in the world is she answering me at 10 o'clock at night? You know, and that's building and breaking down that trust and respect that you have with your client. It's actually doing damage more than good. So yeah, stop it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> stop absolutely. doing that. <laughs> All right, moving on. What's another sleep hygiene fundamental? Make it quiet. Another simple one. I can't tell you how many complaints of once I start talking to people, they're like, oh, yeah, my husband. Sorry, husbands. Um, They snore or I hear the dogs barking across the street and it really disrupts my sleep all the time. It's so important. So using soft foam earplugs, doing a little white noise. Oh, my goodness. It can make a world of a difference Mm -hmm. as well as um, making sure that it is completely dark, um, doing something like a mask at night has been a game changer for so many people. We, like I mentioned, we're very sensitive to light. And at nighttime, any tiny bit of light can make our melatonin think it's time to wake up and really mess things up. So even Mm. waking up in the middle of the night and looking at your bright clock staring at you, Mm. try to avoid that. You know, using a sleep mask has been a game changer. I know for my husband, uh, he always had sleep issues and that's all that I did for him. Amazing. And um, so many of my other clients. So yep. quiet and dark. <laughs> yes. And then as she says, a mask, we're talking a face mask that goes over the eyes, yeah. not a mask over your mouth and nose. Just yes, to point that out mask. for the obvious. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good deal. Moving on. Tell us another one. Um, pay attention to your temperature. You already kind of hinted on this earlier. A lot of times people do tend to sleep better in the winter because it's just cooler. We want to make sure our room's not too hot, not too cold, because that can really wake us up. So trying to make sure um, that your bedding is very um, naturally able to release heat or hold heat depending on different times, um, because Mm -hmm. it can really increase our hormones. Um, in temperature extremes. Yeah. So if you live in, say, England or Europe, you are heating your home with radiators and those can get really hot Mm -hmm. in the wintertime. So a lot of times, uh, you know, people will have a winter duvet and a summer duvet. They swap out that bedding um, that's based on, you know, the season itself. Whereas Mm -hmm. if you are in the States and it's all regulated by air conditioning and heat, um, that also can get very oppressive very quickly if you're having significant highs during the day and super cold lows at night. So Mm -hmm. is there a a kind of median zone that you should set your thermostat at or is there, is everybody different? You have to sort of play around with it. Most people tend to sleep best at around 65, which is pretty, you know, pretty low, but that's pretty um, average for most people. 
Okay, good. Good to know. And again, test it out. You know, I think it's so interesting for me when um, it's it can sometimes be one or two degrees off where it's mm-hmm. all wrong or mm-hmm. you, you fall asleep, uh, not to say I've ever done this, uh, but you fall asleep in your yoga pants and you're like, ugh, this fabric is like, I was just sweating <laughs> the whole night instead of actually yeah. bedding down and putting real pajamas on instead. So, you know, if anybody out there <clears throat> that's guilty like me who's fallen asleep in their clothes from the day, you know, taking the time to actually, um, you know, change into pajamas and and all that, which I think builds into this next point about rituals. Tell me about that. Yeah, this is one of my favorite ones is have a relaxing ritual at night that you look forward to. I think a lot of times, um, most of the clients I see, and then me at 1.2, I looked forward to the end of the day to binge watch my favorite TV show. There's nothing wrong with that, but we don't want to do that until midnight, right? And then try to go to sleep. So instead, let's have a different relaxing ritual at night that we really like that is conducive for sleep. So using, um, I love to diffuse relaxing oils and take an Epsom salt bath, read a book, really just set the tone for sleep. Maybe a little light journaling, manifesting, meditation, All of those things are so conducive for sleep. And I'm not talking five minutes before you're ready. You're in bed five minutes trying to go to Mm. bed. I'm talking one to two hours before you even get into the bedroom um, to really start making that something really enjoyable that you really look forward to. Yeah. And I I like that as almost a playful challenge because, I mean, how many of us, we're all so privileged, aren't we, who have a bathroom pantry full of bath gels and scrubs and all sorts of stuff that are just sitting there going off, right? Like instead of tonight binge watching something on your favorite on-demand player, uh, go and just like take a dive into your your spa pantry that you already have and and play tonight and just say, okay, I'm going to do a foot scrub. I'm going to do this instead tonight. I'm going to put on some soft music or low lighting and just take a moment to pamper myself and just see how it feels. Yeah, it'll be interesting because your body will start craving that more and more. Mm. We think our body's craving, you know, I just want to relax and watch TV. And that might be, you know, true-ish. But once you give it even better alternative option, it will start craving it. You'll look forward to that evening relaxing soak all the time. Your body's just going to get all the right signals. Exactly what we talked about earlier. It's going to get all the right signals that, okay, it's safe. It's so time to relax and go to sleep. Yeah. And I think f- for a lot of us, we we talk it up. We go, oh, well, I don't have all the right supplies. I don't have all the right things. It's going to take too much time to run mm-hmm. a bath or to get it all in order, right? And, and and I hear that kind of negative Nancy voice in my head that goes, well, I just want to zone out. I just want to put something on TV and not have to think. But in mm-hmm. essence, you are thinking it because your, your brain is processing whatever storytelling's on the screen, right? So it's, yeah. again, something to consider. So what's the last one? Last one, also vital, so important, not just for sleep, for so many different aspects, but quiet digestion, specifically no foods at all before bed, at least three hours, three hours. So it's really important because our body at nighttime needs to rest and repair, Mm -hmm. needs to get rid of toxins. It needs to fight off infections. It needs to handle the emotions of the day. If we just ate a meal, our body is going to be focused on digesting that food and not healing and repairing. And that's Mm -hmm. not, that's just one aspect that we don't want to happen. But also when we are focused on digesting, our body's not as focused on sleeping and resting and repairing. And it can cause a really light, restless sleep Mm -hmm. um, that we definitely don't want either. People have been there, man, I fall asleep pretty easy, but I'm just restless and I feel tired the next day. That's not adequate sleeping either. So even if you can fall asleep, but you are just waking up multiple times throughout the night, that's also not um, a good sound sleep for rest and repair. 
Yeah, and I want to talk about some things that maybe are TMI for some people, but we're just going to go there because I've got you as a captive audience, Shay, and I really am curious about your expert expertise. So I notice as I'm getting older, I am really focused on hydration. I drink a lot of water throughout the day. Uh, my, my personal quote is to do more water than coffee. That's always a good good target to hit, which means that I'm going to the bathroom like a lot. Um, um, and sometimes having to go in the night, is that should we cut off drinking water at some point as well? Yeah, if you are having that issue, some people don't have that issue whatsoever, mm -hmm. um, but other people definitely do, and it's a common thing. So if you notice that that is an issue, definitely don't drink a whole water bottle right before bed. Obviously, we're going to have an issue with that. So you're going to have to play with that one a little bit. It might be one hour before bed. That's fine. It might be four hours before bed, depending on your bladder capacity. So, yeah. um, you know, it's really kind of unique to the individual, but absolutely true that you may have to limit water intake towards the evening. Yeah. Cause one thing that I've been doing lately that really has helped is whenever I have this kind of late night cravings of wanting to eat something, whether it's sweet or salty is replacing it with a non caffeinated hot tea, you know, mm -hmm. like a chamomile or, or something like that. Um, and I feel like that really helps, but then again, that kind of it's more liquids going into the system. So, you know, try to test that and see what works for you tonight. Um, because I think sometimes we eat at night. Our snacking is not because we're actually hungry. It's just that we're mm. bored or we want something in our hands that feels warm and soothing or all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm totally for for those things, if it doesn't cause bladder issues in the middle of the night. Mm. I love, personally, I love to drink bone broth at night. Um, I also love herbal teas as well. Mm -hmm. um, it is something I recommend. There's some really great ones that also help digestion. Um, like you mentioned, chamomile is a great one. Valerian, passion flower, lemon balm. Yeah. Um, also ginger, turmeric, those type of things are great for digestion. So um, yeah, I love it if you can tolerate it. Mm. So again, carrying on the TMI conversation, but I think so many people would be curious about this. Let's talk about number twos. So how many number twos should we be having? Uh, how, many, how many times should we be pooping during the day if, in essence, we're getting good night's rest? Yeah, two times is optimal. Per day, uh, two, guys. Two days. Yeah, two per day. Two to, two to three per day is optimal very uncommon, I hate to say. Mm. Um, the average American is constipated, and that means they're going a few times a week, even yeah. every other day. Also, if you're going every day, but you are having rabbit pellets, also not normal. So it needs to be well-formed, good stools two to three times a day. Um, because I have the flip side where people are like, oh yeah, I go three or four times a day. Oh, what, what consistency and oh, not good, no. <laughs> not good consistency. So that's not normal either. So two well-formed, easy to pass bowel movements daily. Yeah. So I imagine in, in your kind of whole picture of you as a person, you know, sleep is an aspect of it. Your nutrition is an aspect of it. How you move your body is an aspect mm -hmm. of it. Stress, all of these things mm -hmm. play into your sleep, but also into your whole well-being, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I really am curious, um, when it comes to sleep in particular, uh, if you don't heed the warnings, if you continue to kind of have the four hours a night and living off of caffeine and, and five hour energy drinks and all the things that are horrible, we know are bad for us. Like what actually could happen? Do you think, I mean, if yeah. we do nothing, if we just continue to put band-aids on it and take more sleeping pills or, um, continue the bad habits, yeah, you will inevitably burn out, not just mentally, emotionally, but physically. And that comes from adrenal stress response. Mm. Um, that is an actual burnout. And that's where we start getting autoimmune diseases, chronic disease like diabetes, because stress increases our blood sugar so much, maybe even more than dietary factors we're finding. Wow. So many different aspects. So it really increases inflammation. We're not able to get rid of the toxins we're exposed to all day if we're not sleeping well. We can't repair and digest the things that we need to. We're not absorbing what we need to at night. We're not restocking our good hormones. So mm. 
going years like that, or even days, if you notice that you miss one night's rest, your cortisol automatically will be higher the next day because it didn't get a good night's rest. So imagine doing that every day. That's so bad for our system, increasing our cortisol like that every single day. We're getting wired and tired. Then we drink more caffeine on top of it. Eventually, we're going to have the opposite effect, which is depressed cortisol. Most people end up in this ebb and flow of both. So depressed cortisol is where you realize, oh, six months ago, I was stressed and just running on fumes. Now I can't even get out of bed. Mm. I am exhausted every morning. It is just like fighting to get up and out of bed. That's where we start seeing that your adrenals are like, I'm done. I'm going to stop pumping out all this cortisol. You're not resting. It's your body is not broken. It's telling you, slow down. Let me rest or else, hey, I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get inflamed. It's going to be a hot mess. And, And that's where we have to use our intuition. If you have a stressful week, Make sleep even more of a priority. If you don't feel good one day, don't just drink extra caffeine and a candy bar to push through. Stop doing that to yourself. Listen to your body and say, oh, I don't feel right tonight. I'm going to definitely do all my sleep hygiene. Really go to bed early. Drink a really good high-protein, high-fat meal for my body. Lots of good fruits and veggies throughout the day. And just relax. If that means taking a day off, heaven forbid, Mm. do it. Listen to our body. That's why there's sick days and mental health days. We need to take advantage of those and really listen because you can prevent a flu type situation or you can prevent a worsening sickness just simply by resting and paying attention. And now more than ever, we must focus and prioritize our immune system and boosting it um, in order to fight viruses off, in order to be our optimum best. And and of course, all of this applies back to business. If you run a Mm -hmm. business and you are um, the one that's in charge, making the decisions, uh, delegating the work, if you feel horrible the next day because of a horrible night's sleep, or weeks of bad sleep, <laughs> um, it is going to rip out, ripple out to all decisions you make from here on out. So it is no longer a, eh, I should probably do something about that next week, next month, next year kind of problem. Mm-hmm. It's a, this is a priority in order to really thrive and be my best. So yeah, yeah. I, I can't agree more. And Shay, you help clients by doing like genetic testing and all of that. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I, with my background in more of a conventional medicine, Mm. I do still love a lot of testing and research. I realized that 90% of the time prescription pharmaceuticals and that type of uh, model isn't super helpful. Mm. Do, is it life-saving and in the moment, super amazing for stabilization? Of course, modern medicine is amazing. But a lot of our chronic disease, 90% or more, is just lifestyle changes and dietary factors and and, uh, really giving our body truly just what it needs to thrive. And um, so I love to use genetic testing. I'm very passionate about it. And the reason why, which would shock most people, it's not because it tells me that this is what you're going to struggle with forever. That's the biggest issue in people who do genetic testing and don't talk about the good part, Mm. which is you can alter your DNA expression through your lifestyle changes. Hmm. Well, heck, that's the only thing that matters. So you go get genetic testing. You've got this depression gene, MTHFR. Everyone kind of throws that around. Oh, great. If you don't educate your patient or client on what that means, they're going to think, oh, I have a depression gene. I'm doomed. I'm depressed for the rest of my life. Right. Heck no. Like, We have got to stop taking the power away from ourselves, thinking this is just what I have. I have to take a prescription for the rest of my life. I want to give the power back to you and realize epigenetics is where it's at. It's what our environment does that changes our DNA expression. So I don't care if you have MTHFR or what you have. We can do things that optimize it, turn it off, just have it expressed differently in a positive way. And that's why I used uh, genetics so that I can teach people, hey, you might have this issue here that lifestyle you're living is making this even worse. It's compounding Mm. on this. 
we need to really focus on lifestyle medi- um, lifestyle changes, and that's not going to be an issue anymore. And that's really empowering for the the client. Mm, it's so interesting to me, and and I also think about my own lifestyle choices, good and bad. You know, the things mm-hmm. that I have um, been raised with and passed down mm-hmm. from my family or parents and you know brother uh, that are, are ways to soothe and numb and and you know all the things. And again, there's some that are good and some that are not so good that we right. instantly think of as a solution um, to stress or winding down or, or what have you. And it's, it is just taking those, the, a step back and zooming out and going, okay, well, this isn't working. This is a hot mess. <laughs> like mm-hmm. what, mm-hmm. what piece of this can I just take a little 20% tweak and change and refine or try something different? And when you have that playful mentality towards something, I think it makes it less, um, you know, it has to be this or everything's a disaster. You know, the, 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 when you have play in what you're doing, you can experience new things, right? Absolutely. And, and that's the biggest thing that, you know, is important is it's not about being perfect. We we're Mm. human and, and that's not, that's not also sustainable or conducive for health because with perfectionism comes what more stress. Right. So that's, that's not going to work. And so I use this terminology, which is maximize the good, Mm. minimize the bad and prioritize what's important, which is healing and laughter and stress reduction and sleep, right? So we just want to maximize, minimize, and prioritize. That just really helps people kind of look back and say day to day, week to week, what did I do 90% of the time? Did that promote wellness or is it promoting illness? And that kind of um, is a really great way to think about it simply. And everything that you mentioned on today's podcast, I mean, these are the ways that parents intuitively put their babies down to sleep at night. We create Mm -hmm. bedtime routines that are, you know, uh, the lights are low, the music is calm, Mm -hmm. it's a lavender bath, it's singing songs, it's reading simple books. I mean, these are the the loving, gentle things that we do for our children that we sometimes forget to do for ourselves. And so I just encourage you guys, if you are intrigued, you've been getting crappy sleep, tonight's the night, my friend, you're going to try it out. So if you want more information about Shay, her website is shaylinner.com. That's S-H-A-E. Again, all the links and resources and things we talk about in today's episode are in the show notes at thesimplifierspodcast.com. And I'm so grateful for you, Shay, to come out and just tell us some of these things because I think that this is so critically important and worth the time and energy to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. It's, definitely, like I mentioned, it's a non-negotiable for health. Mm, And such a tiny thing that could create big impact in a positive Mm -hmm. way for your life. So Shay, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you as we wrap up. Uh, I'd like to ask every single guest on the podcast. And again, thank you so much for your time. My first question is this one. Uh, Tell us what's one book or blog that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or poking holes and challenging your belief system. I, okay, I'm an avid book reader and I believe in the power of books. I believe that successful people read. So I love reading. Mm. The book I'm actually reading right now is a reread for probably the second or third time. And um, I use it a lot in my client sessions. I use it a lot every day personally, but it's kind of an interesting one. It is called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself Mm. by Joe Dispenza. Great mindset book. If you follow me on anything or you're about to, you're going to learn a lot about mindset and the power of mindset and how we really have a placebo effect in life. And and this book speaks on that, speaks on meditation and the placebo effect and how powerful our mind is, how it actually biochemically can change our bodies um, through our thinking patterns. Mm, Dr. Joe Dispenza, I mean, he is an incredible author, an incredible expert out there. I am enjoying um, Becoming Supernatural, which is another book by him, yep. which mm-hmm. literally will blow your mind when you start tapping yeah. into your subconscious, your super conscious, and, and really understanding what your intuition is trying to tell you. It's a game changer. So It truly is, yeah. We'll link the, uh, this book in the show notes for people if you guys want to check that out. 
So tell us who's one person in your network, somebody that you know personally, you just feel is up to brilliant things. We could shine a spotlight on them and who knows, maybe one day we'll have them on the podcast. I love this question. And uh, I, the first person who comes to mind is my personal mentor. She really helped me get started in this. She introduced me to Joe Dispenza, which is so ironic, but her name is Jenna Clack. She is a functional pharmacist. She also practices um, health coaching and functional medicine. She's one of those people that are, they just do it. And that's the perfect way to explain her. She was from Midland, Texas, you know, in the whole pharmacy um, school total thing. She, she was like, I want to do functional medicine and I want to move to Costa Rica. Next thing I knew she was there, you right. know, li- living on the beach. And I just, I love that from her. Yeah. There's so many things I learned from her, but just to live is, is one of those things. So she's great. Love it. We will link her up in the show notes for people if you guys want to check her out as well. So I believe gratitude and simplicity go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Tell me what's one thing you're grateful for like today. Okay. I love this question too, because yes, there's so many things I'm grateful for and having uh, gratitude journaling and things like that, something I do regularly. Mm. But today I am so grateful for my job as a health coach. I recently, fairly recently was able to leave my conventional medicine um, job as a PA, which was a big deal to completely do this in a completely different direction. But the main goal was still to help people And it has helped me so much, but my clients are amazing. I cannot stop smiling about what I'm doing every day and the people I get to meet and talk to every day. It has been just like so, so awesome. So Mm, yeah, absolutely. So great to hear. And if you're curious about what Shay does for her clients, she does one-to-one concierge care, specialized lab testing, and more specifically to help you get a handle on your wellness and sleep and, and more things. You can go to her website at shayleonard.com for more information there. So my final question for you is this today. And again, thanks for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope loads and loads of people around the world right now are, are getting ready for <laughs> sleep tonight and getting all cozy. And, and I love the thought of that. So someone somewhere is listening to us right now and she hasn't slept good for days, maybe even weeks. The stress is overwhelming at times. She has homeschooling by day, trying to grapple, keeping her business and her work alive. All things are starting to come fraying at the edges. What's one thing you could whisper to her right now just to encourage her in this moment? I would definitely say just make your sleep a priority like eating. It's just a priority. So when you think day to day, because that person's probably not stopping um, Mm -hmm. towards bedtime. They've got so much. They're so busy during the day. They do have to make lunches right before bedtime and they've got to do all these things. And and we just, I rather you wake up a little earlier than just try to go to bed later because we just can't do that consistently. And so make the sleep a priority, recognize its power and what it can truly do. I, it's the, one of the first things I start with, because you may not be motivated to work out or to eat well, or to do the manifesting because you can't sleep. You're so exhausted. So making that sleep a priority is truly going to make all the other stressors in life so much easier to manage. And so you can start kind of picking at those as well. Mm, and you deserve it. You're worth yeah. having a great night's sleep tonight. And so we are both encouraging you on. Thank you so much for your time today, Shay. Thank you so much. I loved it. Thank you. 